Hi, and welcome to episode number seven of What Sex Got to Do With It with my wonderful (laughs) 84-year-old great-grandmother author who is my favorite grandmother in all of the East Coast of the United States. (laughs) You are a devil, (laughs) yes, you are. (laughs) So, 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 So this chapter is called My What a Big Brain You Have. That you want was, to tell us why? Yeah, that's kind of a play on Little Red Riding Hood. Oh, my, what big eyes you have. My, what big ears you have. Yeah. My, what a big mouth you have. Right. You know, the better to gobble you up with. But uh, So it was sort of the thing, my, what a big brain you have, because intelligence is one of the things, uh, perceived intelligence is one of the things that makes a man attractive to a woman. And, you know, I don't have a lot of faith in um, standardized intelligence tests. I think they measure, they're almost a social construct. Right. But there's a lived intelligence that women are very quick to spot. And it's often, uh, to me, best reflected in a sense of humor. Right. Uh, Women love men with a good sense of humor, quick on the uptake. Those are all signs of intelligence that women do code, oh, he was really smart. Right. You know, uh, oh, like, how could you not fall for him? He was so smart. You know, so I heard that kind of thing a lot. So it just sort of, uh, this chapter indicates that I believe that one of the things that drove human evolution was selection for a, a special kind of intelligence. In our case, intelligence, you know, if my hypothesis about the origin of our species being that right. chromosome um, fusion Uh, We might have been born with some traits that were not necessarily adaptive. And so by selecting for intelligence, women were selecting for men who knew how to fit themselves to uh, manipulate the environment in such a way that they might survive in it, even though they were hairless apes. They might not have had the the fur to keep them warm, but they had an ability to figure out how to build a shelter, those kinds of things. Right, right, I got you. And this is so much in this chapter, it's gonna really be hard to squeeze it into uh, 30 minutes, because I was was really, he he brought, discuss a lot of things that I've thought about and and um, your conclusions in some cases are a little bit different than mine and so we'll <laughs> explore that you know because I mean, you talk about the brain being um, more than than a computer you mm-hmm. know you and not necessarily more different from a computer the brain is different from a computer right but but you do still see it as a mechanism though right yeah I guess yeah Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I have said to people, the human brain is not a skilled worker. That is one of my lines, but it's very good at two things. It's been shaped by evolution to be very good at survival, short-term survival, and at reproduction. Right, 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 right. right. That's what it's best at. Right. And it, it can really trick itself, use language to trick itself about other things in order to, to make sure that those two things get accomplished. Right. So it's a very skilled worker if you're talking about getting people to reproduce. Uh, right. But it's not such a good a skilled worker if you're trying to, for example, get <laughs> political parties to see reasonable solutions, that right. kind of thing. Right, so, mm-hmm. the, so one of the things you say is that AI will not be able to reproduce what the brain does? Uh, Well, yeah, and you are much more familiar with AI than I am. Um, So I'm interested in your viewpoints on this too. My bias on this is what little I've read on AI, which is just a few books, is that the human brain and artificial intelligence to me, they're different animals right. with different functions. And so to try to use the computer as a model for the human brain, I argue with that a little bit because um, I think our human brains are very good technologically. We're good at designing things because we have systems in place to keep us honest. You know, I really believe that language has given us the ability to lie to ourselves. Yeah. Self-deception, deceit, we're very good at those things. But we have designed systems to keep us honest. I was thinking about your remark 
um, the other week when we interviewed about the difference between logic and rationale. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. And, and I said, well, we're good at rationalizing. To me, logic is a set of rules that we've set up to keep our rationalization in line. Mm -hmm. So we have that, to me, that's a system of rules that keeps the human brain from getting out of line with its rationalization. And I view the scientific method the same way. The scientific method is a system of rules we've designed to keep our brain in check because it does get up to no good. Um, and so I, that's why I think the, the human brain has designed computers to make up for the flaws. You know, the computer is really good at holding information right. in a way that the human brain is not. So we've designed computers and probably artificial intelligence as well to make up for some of the failings that our skill with self-deception um, put into the human brain. That's, gotcha. Does that make sense, yeah, does. Lent? Does, does that make yeah. any sense no, no, at all? I mean, yeah, you know. And so, so this is maybe at this point, we, we, there, it, there's not a good connection to the previous question, and maybe I'll tie this back in, maybe not, viewer, we're just kind of having fun in this conversation here. You know, so consciousness. Oh. In, in, I think of it as an emergent property. What, and, do, you, what do you mean by an emergent property? So to that, you have this network of neurons in the brain that are thinking, that are doing things primarily focused on, on sex. And what was the other one you said? Re uh, survival. Survival, sex yeah, and survival. survival. You know, the survival is a big thing. Big, yeah. you know, big, you can put a lot into survival. You know. But the sense of self I mean, is emergent from that network. I mean, because I think the self, sense of self is what people see as the spirit. And it's like, well, I mean, of course, I me, mean, there's no like real, in their minds, I mean, there's no mechanism, I me, mean, for this sense of consciousness, you know. Uh, but I see it as an emergent property from, from the the network of neurons in the brain. You know, I, where do you where, I, do, where I, do you think I, consciousness think, comes I from? I think that that's true. Yeah. I, I, I believe that humans have consciousness. I actually think that probably all. Um, species have kind of a sense of consciousness. By that, I simply mean a sense of self, right. an awareness of self. And I think it's a real thing, but like philosophers like Daniel Dennett, I, I part company with him on this. He, he thinks that consciousness is an illusion. Um, uh, uh, I, maybe I've stated that wrong. He yeah. might not have used those exact words. But what do you think he means by illusion? Um, that he, do, he doesn't think that it's I, I shouldn't speak for him yeah. because I don't, you know, but I know when I was reading his book that I had just paid over $30 for <laughs> hardcover, he said some things that angered me so much, I felt like throwing it not only across the room, but right through my skylights, which would have been very expensive to repair. So so I know that, that and he's very held in very high regard, so I have right. to be careful not to misrepresent, but I... I have, you know, I, if, if it feels real to us and we base our behavior on our sense of self, I, I, I just, you know, if it feels real and you act as if it's real, then to me it is real. I like your idea of emergent. It's kind yeah, of I was emergent. wondering if that's what he means me by, by um, what was the term that he, he said, you know, illusion? You know, yeah, well, that's it? that. It's a word I put in his mouth. So yeah. maybe I, the book that I wanted to throw across the room, I maybe should go home and read again. I still do have it yeah, uh -huh. with angry notes scribbled in the margins. That's how I. That's how I read books. But a book that that warrants no notes in the margins, that's not a good book. I, you know, the books that have influenced me the most are the books I fight with while I'm reading them, and and I express. You know, I, I, I have dialogue like you and I are having now with the books I read. I write in the margins. I put notes on all the right. fly with page numbers uh, on on the various fly leaves. And if I filled them all up, then that's that's a this book I to, never want to lend to anybody. Gotcha. Yeah, of course, with your notes in it. You know, uh, uh, so, so, um, so, yeah, so we're going to, we're backing up, as you can maybe tell uh, in this chapter. Uh, so you had talked about uh, to some lecture that you attended with, um, I guess it was Elizabeth Loftus. Uh, she was. Uh, she was the speaker. Yes. Uh, and, and that, uh, 
She, you say she not only convincingly described research that documented the ease with which false memories can be suggested into existence, but she also fooled the audience into creating a few flawed memories of, of her own. And can you tell me a little bit more yeah. about that experience? I it's, it's a subject I didn't realize I was interested in until I heard her speak. And I was there with a friend when it was over, Sarah and I turned to each other and went, wow. That was life-altering, just the sense that false memories can be implanted that easily. Now, most of the false memories that she implanted in the audience did not work for me because I suffer from face blindness, prosopagnosia, yeah. and a lot of those involved sh photographs of faces and confusing us about who did what. But the research that she described with children when she first began um, studying uh, false memories and the ease with which false memories are implanted were astonishing to me. For example, she would suggest to a child, oh, we talked to your grandmother, and she reminded us of the time you got lost in the mall. This child has never been lost in the mall. However, that then became a traumatic memory for the child. And even having the grandmother tell and the researcher tell and everybody tell her, no, 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 that didn't really happen. We were just kind of playing a game with you. Very difficult to remove that memory, even when told it was wrong. So she tried to move to memories that would be less traumatic. Do you remember the time you got sick after eating chocolate right. ice cream? Well, guess what? then the child has an aversion to chocolate ice cream because they have a memory of having gotten sick eating it, even though they never did. So those were the kinds of experiments she talked about and how the, the ethical responsibility she felt in designing those kinds of experiments to try to come up with a memory that wouldn't alter a person's life by being told that, that it had happened when in fact it hadn't. And, um, so I just found that completely fascinating. And I think in this chapter, is this the chapter where I describe my sister and I having totally different memories of the identical event? Yeah, it, no, I think that's another chapter. Okay, but, another but, um, chapter. But, you know, um, but I mean, you, yeah, why don't we save it for then? Okay, and, yeah, And, and sure. if I don't talk about it in that chapter, we can... You know, sure. Or if I don't bring it up, you know, then... then well, yeah. it's just that I'm aware that, that yeah. memory is tricky. You know, I can believe something passionately to be true and then have to acknowledge that maybe I'm wrong about that. Right. And having seen Elizabeth Loftus, one of the things that I say is I know I, I yield too easily in family arguments right. now because I now know that my memory can be wrong. Yeah. And, and, and once you're aware of that, it, it, it is life-altering. My, right. my friend was, was correct yeah. in describing that as life-altering. And my understanding, too, from, I think it was on 60 Minutes a few years ago, is that memories are mutable, too. It seems like each time you access a memory, you store it differently. You know, and, and they did some research for uh, people who had PTSD. Mm -hmm. And if they activated the memory, and they used a drug at the same time he, when the memory was accessed and they and then stored again because it's somehow when you access the memory you make it susceptible to being stored again with that drug there i mean it got stored in a way that wasn't as powerful you know uh, uh, so that it kind of took away the ptsd because the memory I mean, was there but i think the deal is that for you get PTSD, the memory has to be stored in a way that also triggers an emotion. Mm -hmm. I mean, and when I, I'm probably remembering this not quite correctly, but then when you put the drug there, I mean, when the memory is accessed, I mean, the ability to store the memory with the emotion that comes with it is removed. Oh, it's a disconnect. It's a then. disconnect. I mean, oh, so that's now you have the memory, but, it's, but it doesn't yeah. carry the emotional I, I kick. Think, I think know? I'm quoting Elizabeth Loftus correctly when she said memories are like uh, Wikipedia entries. You can take your information out and alter it and then put it back in, yeah. but so can other people. Yeah. And that's what's astonishing to right. me. Right, You're right. not the only one. And every time you take it out and remember it, it alters a little bit yeah. when you put it back you in. Put it back, yeah. So our memories are always transforming. Right. They're not accurately stored, but they help us create meaningful senses of ourselves, a meaningful sense of ourselves and our lives, and keep us 
keep us whole in a way right. uh, so that we can proceed forward. So we construct memories to help us help us survive, actually. Right. Right, 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 right. Yeah, and it's funny. It's funny to me for um, what you. That is the when you say about the Wikipedia. That was the end of of that paragraph. I mean, and and it was something about the uh, this section that kind of reminded me, you know, of um, something that was written by Jennifer Lerner, who is at the Kennedy School, you know, and she has this article called. Um, the Angry Mind, it's, um, oh, I'm forgetting the, the exact title of it, uh, something in the Angry Mind, you know, and and it's really about how um, the Angry Mind, you know, is a mind that's very certain of itself, you know, and, and, and when you are certain, that's when you stop thinking, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and that's what generally gets us in trouble is that we are no longer open uh, to new ideas, and so with anger, you are convinced that someone else has done you a wrong. I mean, and once you're convinced of that, you know, then you're not going to reconsider that at all. You know? And uncertainty is the state at which you are most open to new ideas. But people don't generally like being uncertain. You well, know? Look, look, creates, I mean, all you have to yeah. do is turn on the TV right. and look at the ferocity yeah. of the divides between right. people, the certainty right. that their view of something is correct. Right. And of course, so so many of our wonderful right. technological inventions amplify the wor the worst yeah. of what it is about us right. the the ability to to be tribal first of all right. and and then algorithms that keep feeding us news right. that right. reinforces what we already believe right. and so there is a lot of anger and and right. Right. to your point yeah. when you're that angry right it's very hard to let new information get introduced. Right. That's that's a species-specific trait we have to learn to rise above, yeah, uh -huh. and we'll do it only by recognizing we're all vulnerable to right. getting a memory wrong. Yeah, we uh -huh. all are. I think once we acknowledge that, then you're a little more able to listen to other people and think, wait, wait, you know, maybe I don't have that quite right. Right. So it's, the article was. Um, the paper was called Decision Making and the Angry Mind. Yeah. Jennifer Learner, I mean, it's really good. You know, and so, and, and, and yeah, so uncertainty is where you are most open to learning mm -hmm. new things, but no one really likes being uncertain. We always <laughs> are fighting. It's like you're trying to resolve that uncertainty. Mm -hmm. and, and along with that, I mean, it's not only anger be, that shuts down you know, the thinking process, it's also um, happiness. Oh, you know, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, happiness can shut down the thinking process too, you, because it creates a state of certainty too. And I've noticed that from being a poker player. You know, I don't go to casinos or anything, but I play a lot with friends. And it's when you win, especially when you win big, you feel really good. And there's their sense of, well, I did this. So where it's anger is like someone's done something to me. I mean, happiness is that I've created this. I mean, and so there's a certainty, and I've learned myself. It's like when I win big. I mean, I really have to work hard, you know, to be conservative in the way that I play I mean, the next few hands because there is that sense of, well, I won, you know, I'm good, you know. I've, uh, I've uh, heard uh, 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 and that uh, someone who wins big the first time they gamble yeah. is much more vulnerable to becoming a problem gambler right. than someone who doesn't. Yeah. Uh, I don't gamble, but the first time I ever went to a casino, I was, my... Uh, late husband was, he was not late at that time, he was still very much alive, but he went to, to get uh, change, and so I just was using the change in my pocket right. in a slot machine, I knew nothing about them, and suddenly bells and sirens started going off, and I thought, oh, I've broken the machine, I've broken the machine. I was a dutiful person, I didn't want to run away, I thought I should stand there and take the responsibility. Right. Suddenly one of the casino workers came to me, and I forget, I won some ridiculous amount of money. I said, did, I'm sorry, first I said to him, I, I, I don't, all I did was pull the thing, I don't, I didn't mean to break it. He said, are you kidding me? He said, because I, I had no idea. But luckily, 
because I don't like that whole yeah, atmosphere, right. I never did go back. Right. Um, so I didn't become a problem gambler. Right. But uh, yeah, I won so, big the first time I ever pulled the handle on a slot machine. So the casino yeah. lost on you. Yeah, you, on, yeah, because yeah. they've never recouped that. Right. But, yeah. Right, right. Well, good, good. You you won big. You know. I don't I, remember how much. So yeah. That, you know, so I probably exaggerate yeah. how much, that's, but that's, that's uh, okay. it felt enormous to me yeah, at the time. Right. So, um, what's your sense I mean, on how the brain's going to evolve? Can Assuming we live long enough to evolve. <laughs> oh, that's an interesting one, Len. Because, as you know, um, part of my motivation for writing this book... I know, book so let's, just, let's, is, let's not... Let's not maybe we just kind of yeah. tease people about where we're going, yeah. but let's say, you know, the species... I think the brain's going to evolve. Oh, I would hope it would evolve be more open to its own fallibility, yeah. I don't think we'll survive unless it does. Right. I think that's, that's, that's a necessary evolution our brain has to take if we're going to continue to survive. So that, so given that if, in my feeling, if we fail to recognize our own imperfections and try to rise above them, we're not going to survive. So to me, the human brain, I hope, evolves to be more aware of its own frailty. Yeah. So do you think it can evolve fast enough on its own? Or will humans have to get in there and muck around with the evolutionary process? And maybe I shouldn't even use the evolutionary process. It's like just get in there and intervene. You know, what do you mean, change? Well, genetic. Ge genetic. Uh, therapies and things like that. Gen genetic intervention. <sighs> which gets us into some, yeah. some interesting territory, right? Yeah, yeah. Because now I, we're starting to make decisions yeah. about which genes and which traits mean we yeah, want I, species. Yeah, that stuff makes me nervous, Len. I, I just want us all to become more aware of our own impact on the world around us but, and to take more responsibility. So Right, but that if, awareness is generated by the brain. By the brain. And so and which has you asked me if the brain is going how it's going to evolve, my my answer would be if we survive, that's how it's going to have to evolve. To become more aware. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And, and to rise above our right, own and, our own. Right, right. Flaws. And then my question to kind of repeat it was that do you think it can evolve quickly enough? You know? I don't know. Maybe, you, maybe, maybe there will be some environmental thing that will. Yeah. I mean, who knows? The infection by a virus or something right, right. that will change our neurology. Right. Uh, it's yeah. possible. Or it could be it, that people who are more socially aware, I mean, I mean, select for each other. I mean, not select for each other, but are more attracted to each other, I mean, and and generate progeny that is more aware. I don't think that can result in change quickly enough. Interesting. And why is that? Well, just our generation, you know, what's what's a generation? How many? 25 years. 25 years. Yeah. I mean, Two. That, that we don't have enough generations. I mean, I, I think see. it would take a lot of generations to affect that kind of change. Gotcha. And oh, oh. Well. So, so you, I don't think there's an, you see, the pessimist in me, and yet my family thinks I am such an optimist. I am, but... In terms of humans, uh, you know, it, if I watch the news, it's right. hard to remain optimistic. Right, gotcha. Okay, so 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 given given the later chapters, which we're getting, yeah, we'll me get a to. very nice big look at right now. You know, uh, uh, so okay, you know, well, that's interesting. And and even though we have a few more minutes, I mean, left in this half hour, it's not quite enough. I mean, to I think launch into. A whole other topic, and and so uh, we don't want to get our editors here at <laughs> ACMI who have been just so generous with their time and facilities. Fabulously you know, generous, and, and, and thank you. Yeah, too. we're we're gonna end this chapter now and tease the next one, with well, what sex got to do with it? <laughs> well, apparently it's on the brain. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so so so, 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 so uh, imagine like a big like. Uh, uh, futon yeah. that has a brain map on it. So, <laughs> so having sex with the brain. Yeah, so thank you very much, Heather, and thanks for watching, and and come back for episode number eight. <laughs>